This is a Hot Pie Media original. Hi, I'm Deb, and this is my podcast. What on earth are you doing with the giant box on the screen? That's what the producer just told me. But uh, it's not just any giant box, guys. Check this out. It's a uh, festive kitchen delivery. And I've decided it's what the kids do, right? They do unboxing. It's not good if you're only listening to this on uh, the podcast. And that's fine. But if you want to go to youtube.com slash the Debo Keefe show, uh, Debo Keefe podcast, what am I doing? Uh, you can watch the unboxing of my festive kitchen food delivery. Hold on, guys. It's going to be some dry ice in here. I'm really excited about this. Okay, what do we got? Caution. Okay, we'll fast forward this bit, okay? It's a really good idea to do it on camera, Deb, um, but let's see what we've got in here. Yes, this is what I was hoping it was. Natalie ordered them for me, but she didn't tell me what she ordered. It's cake balls, guys. All I got to do is turn the oven on, stick them in and serve them to my friends and tell them that I did not get them from festivekitchen.com slash Deb. I made them myself. That's what I'm going to do. I've got friends coming over this weekend and that is why the lovely Natalie over here at Hot Pie Media ordered me this food from Festive Kitchen. But I'm telling you, if you've got friends over for a game, maybe you've got family uh, in town and you don't want to cook, you can go to festivekitchen.com slash Deb or shopfestivekitchen.com slash Deb. As long as you use my code in the gift code uh, checkout, you're going to get uh, $20 off your first $100, uh, $100 order. And you can send these boxes. They're like a hug in the mail. You can send them to a friend. Maybe he's going through a hard time. Uh, maybe you're coming back from vacation and you just don't want to think about having to prepare dinner for you and the family. Go to shop.festivekitchen.com. Use my code DEB. That gets you 20% off. And... Uh, that's off your whole first order. All right, guys, you can get tons of great food on this, not just snacks and not just cake balls. They've got full meals as well. Check them out at festivekitchen.com slash Deb. And thank you to Refine Aesthetics for being a sponsor of the show. Uh, do you ever look in the mirror and just go, oh, Lord, I think my face has shifted. I think if you're 20 and you're watching this or listening to this, you probably haven't thought that. But if you're, uh, you know, getting up towards where I am, you do start to notice some changes in your face. You, you lose collagen and you lose like the firmness of your cheeks that you had when you were younger. And at Refine Aesthetics, they really take pride in the fact that they want you to feel your best self, right? So maybe let's get you back to feeling good about how you look. And they can do that with so many different ways. Um, if you've lost some of that volume in your face, like I have refined aesthetics, I'll be in soon to talk about some Botox and some fillers. All right. Not too shy to talk about that, but they can help with that. It's going to boost your confidence. These guys at Refine Aesthetics are artists and it's their goal to make you feel just refined and perfected, which is how we all want to feel. And uh, you can go in and visit them. They're a lovely location, downtown Austin or online at refineaesthetics.com. Don't forget to mention the Debo Keefe podcast. When you book your appointment, you'll get 15% off. You like that? 15% off. Refineaesthetics.com. Treat yourself. You're beautiful and you'll feel purified, perfected and refined with Refine Aesthetics. Thank you for joining me. Thanks for returning. If uh, this isn't your first time watching or listening to my podcast, I ran into somebody in a bar the other day who said they were waiting for the next episode to come out. It just made me really smile. So thank you. If you're subscribing uh, and you're listening or you're watching, are you watching today, mum? Hi, if you're out there. I know she watches. Um, but I got a really cool message from 
Jason Castillo. He wrote to me, just a shout out to the last episode or two ago when you interviewed your brother. It was very great and enjoyed to hear about your brother's life journey. It reminded me of a conference that I attended recently. It was all about expanding empathy and being vulnerable. And kudos to you on how you react to the haters. (laughs) Thanks. Send me more hate mail. I haven't got any since I, I read those last messages that were so disgusting in Espanol. They were awesome. I I really enjoyed getting the hate mail. It's fine by me. Bring it on. Um, But in response to Jason's response about uh, his conference that he went to, I actually looked up some of these conferences. um, I think they're a great idea. I had a chat with a guy friend the other day, and I love him to death. Born and raised in the country, and he admits it. He's got some, some personal biases that he's sort of working through and asks a lot of questions of me and some of his other uh, more liberal friends. And um, it's lovely talking to somebody that is is willing to grow and to learn some of, I guess what we would say, like new phrases, toxic masculinity, um, being an ally, all those things. Um, and I think, wouldn't it be great if we could just have a class in school that would teach boys just like how not to be dicks? Because it just sort of it just sort of happens with it within you know young boys' mentalities, what they've been taught by their father figures, if they've had any, um, what they're taught by messaging in the world, and it just leads to so much um, anger and vitriol and that ego that is also you know that huge ego that is just completely connected to a, a huge ball of insecurities, right? And um, I love I love it when I hear people trying to grow and trying to work through that. Like my brother talking about really trying to come from a place of no ego. And that is hard. And it's hard to change. We talked about changing. And, you know, if you're in you're in your 30s, 40s, you've had a lifetime of of messaging and being who you are. And it's hard to look at those things and say, I want to change them. And then it's even hard for those changes to stick and stay in your brain. So I say keep at it. You can do it if you acknowledge that maybe you've got some of these biases or anger or resentment towards specific groups or types of women or whatever it might be. Have a look at them, investigate them. Um, And, you know, maybe you'll come out the other side a little happier. Now, I'm not trying to tell you men what to do because I know that pushes your buttons. It's just a light suggestion. Just a teensy suggestion. Have a look into it. There's conferences everywhere. There's books. There's classes. As your women friends you can talk to, as your minority friends you can talk to, stop othering them as well. All right, I'm off my soapbox. To the guest portion of my show today, and again, it's a, a very well-known musician who uh, is just happens to be a friend of mine, and that's I'm pulling my strings, guys. I'm going through my Rolodex. Kids know what that means? I've never had a Rolodex. That was a stupid thing to say go through the phone and have a look at who's there and who wants to talk. And today my guest is band leader, extraordinaire, world traveler, <laughs> musician, arranger, songwriter, yeah, and friend, Carlos Sosa. I've had, I need that button for the round of applause. Let's do it. There we go. Oh, look. They just, yes. <laughs> Guys, I'm getting it. I love it. Welcome, Carlos. Hello. How are you, my love? I'm good. It's so nice to see you. It's good to see you. It's been a while. It has. It's been we really, were just trying to figure it out a little while ago. How long has it been? And it's been a few years. Yeah. But we've had we've had some. I like I like to think of an, a bit of an intertwined friendship. Mm-hmm. I think um, we've got Lucky Lounge. Yeah. <laughs> Will from Lucky Lounge, which is this really cool bar in Austin. Used to be. Used to be. Not here anymore. Like everything else, I think mm-hmm. it's going to be a high rise, right? Something like that. Uh, and then randomly. You met my mom in England. What you're trying to hit on my mom or something? I, t- what, I told somebody that story the other day, and they were like, "Wow, how did that happen?" Isn't that bizarre? It was crazy. I mean, I think you know the story. I do know the story, yeah. and but I'm happy. I want you to share it with the listeners and okay. the viewers because it's it's so charming. It's so small world, and yet we're inter- interconnected again. Yeah. So I I. Um, Oh wait, hang on a second. We've gonna. I think we need to do some background. Oh, like you. an intro. Yeah, like so people know who you are. I know who you are and why you were there and how you met my mum in England. <laughs> but right. t- tell everybody what you do and some of the projects you've worked on and why people might go. Oh yeah, I kind of know his stuff too. It's funny. I did a. I did a. This. It's a long story, but I did a splice. There's a. There's a website called Splice for producers and engineers, or whatever, and they make sample packs for 
producers. Right. So I just did a splice sample pack and I did the promo video recently. And I was kind of, there's all these cameramen and all this stuff and I'm in the studio and they're like, so yeah, do you have your bio ready? And I was like, oh, I hate talking about myself. You know, it's like, <laughs> yes, I don't know. I don't, so I just like went to my Wikipedia page and I'm just like, that's so nice. So I wrote down, let's see. Oh, so so you I'm, have I'm gonna, your bio. No, I just said, so I'm Carlos Sosa. And then I went down the list. You might have heard me with Jason Raz, Kelly Clarkson, Zach Brown Band, Maroon 5, Mike Posner, Jesse and Joy, Warren Haynes, Beverly Knight, Backstreet Boys, Dumpster Funk, Trevor Hall, Michael Ferranti, Luis Fonzi. Yeah, out of sight. That was like, yeah. <laughs> wow. that was like a- That's a brag yeah. list. Yeah, but I had to do something. Like, yes. I hate that because I don't want to brag, you know, but it's like- But you've worked with- I did it. These huge names. Mm. And as I said in the beginning, you're a band leader. You're a, is it weird to call you a wind instrument guy? Because it makes you sound like you just make farts for a living. I mean, I don't want <laughs> I'm a saxophone player. A sax yeah. Do well, I really saxophonist? like- Saxophonist? Yeah. What I what I wanted to do when I was a kid was I loved James Brown. I loved Earth, mm. Wind & Fire. I loved um, uh, he, uh, well, all the Michael Jackson records, anything with horns in it, right? So that's what I wanted to do. I didn't necessarily- Saxophone. I started playing the saxophone, but then I fell in love with horn sections. Mm. And I wanted to be like the guy. Yeah. The guy for everything. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you you can play every every single instrument in the horn uh, section? No. Well, kind of a little bit. A little bit enough yeah. to write those parts and and put all the parts together. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I can barely play trombone, but I could play trumpet. Well, that, that seems tough. And I have played trumpet in front of a lot of people. Yeah, like fifty thousand or something. Uh, and but, you're like, this isn't but, my instrument, guys. But you you're also like being a professional musician on that kind of scale. You also become a really good actor. Mm -hmm. So you do enough to fake it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Oh God, I and then everybody thinks you're amazing. You're like, oh my God, <laughs> he can play all these instruments. And you're like three notes. And that, that does it. I could teach you how to do it in probably five minutes. Oh, that'd be wonderful. You I'd, just have to have the confidence. You know, you have to have the bravado. Yeah. You go up on stage. You're like, I got this. Yeah. That's half of life. I think. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> fake it till you make it. Yeah. I hate that phrase, but it's true. So yeah, that's what I do. I, I, I uh, became, I went to school for audio engineering and wanted to be a producer, but I fell in love with doing this horn thing, this mm. horn thing. And then I, when I, I interned at a recording studio in Austin, that's no longer here. Then I bought the studio, owned it for four years. Then I sold it. And then I brought the Pro Tools rig home. Mm -hmm. So I started doing horns remotely for people all over the planet. So then yeah, I've been doing that for like 20 years. So that that's what brings you to be able to work with all these artists. Now you don't have to necessarily be there. I've right. been in your studio. It's huge. You could fit a 20-piece band in there. Yeah. And probably have. Yeah. And so you can mix it all up and just send it down the line. Yeah. Producers, people all over, they, they just send me uh, MP3. Mm -hmm. And that they've been doing that for a long time. So they send me an MP3. I write the parts. I arrange them, send it back to them. And it's like Christmas. And it's, you, you know. professional? Tell me. That's what they do. Uh, that's amazing. I love that. I love that you've got the flexibility to do that. Although, does it take away some of the the old school vibe of going to someone else's studio no. and recording your bits? It's still you still get the same feeling. Because I'm kind of a control freak. <laughs> so I got that when you said I was the intern, and then I bought the place. <laughs> that was great. I uh, <laughs> wonderful. Well, you know, because I, I I've kind of like when I was younger, I would listen to like a Motown record with horns, and I. I'd get those sounds and then I'd listen to Earth, Wind & Fire. They'd listen to Phil Collins and I'd make sure I got those sounds. So any sound that I wanted, I have control in my studio to do. Yeah. And a lot of re professional recording studios, even when, you know, like 90s and 2000s, they didn't really do a lot of horns because it was all about grunge and mm. just a lot of guitars and mm -hmm. drums and bass, right? No horn section in the food not a, Yeah, not that kind of thing. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. He's, he's a mover and a shaker, that guy. Yeah, he is. And, a, and an author now. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. So Wait, uh, hang on a sec. Did I, just, did I just completely miss, like, is there a little, did you put a little cherry right there? Yeah, I did. <gasps> you heard it here first. <laughs> you, wait, not, not, <laughs> you didn't hear it here first. <laughs> We'll Shit, see. go back and rewind. And then do you see the look of dumbness in my face as I look to me? Are you kidding me? No, I mean, well, we have, we have. Wow. Connections, Zach Brown connections. So. I just got a little lady boner about that. <laughs> that's great news. I mean, not, not, not just for me, but for you, that's super exciting. I love hearing people doing collaborations yeah. with people that I love. We'll see. Yeah. Okay. No, no more said. 
Um, this is the show, though. If you ever want to drop an exclusive, we've we're already responsible for that. I mean, the big exclusive we just dropped recently, huge bomb, blew up the internet. This is where you come to do it, just you know, for future reference. Okay. All right, got it. So I'm I'm going to be your source when you tell people. So. Any, uh, what was I saying? Okay. So yeah, I do horns. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what I do. That's and what you do. Yeah. I do horns. But that's I was going to say that I was, I was at the last time I was at somebody else's studio mm. was a very important record that did really well. And the artist was there and that's the problem because they, they want to control. They things. want, they're like, Oh, why don't you do this? Mm. And then like put the trumpet note on top of here and do this. And then it's like, it's terrible. I it's like, it. Oh, Instead of here's your package, yeah, just let, to how great just let me do, just let me do my thing, and if yeah. you don't like it, tell me. Yeah, we can flip and a bit I'll, here and there. Yeah, I'll do whatever, but let me I do my that. thing first, you know. Yeah, and then I started actually it ties into to the the uh, your brother thing and stuff. But I met somebody through your brother's wife. I met a lot of people through your brother's wife. How did you meet her to begin with? Brother's wife is a R and B singer in England. She's also a musical theater genius. She's mm -hmm. starring in The Drifters Girl right now. It's amazing and i started writing songs uh taking it very seriously like seven years ago and now i'm starting to like get songs placed and nice yeah it's good so did you write a song for bev is that the connection i didn't no i met rod temperton through bev who was responsible for he wrote all of the early michael jackson like um rock with you mm. and he wrote thriller mm -hmm. so that's mm. the best song best selling song of all time and when I was a kid, like Rod, Temp stuff yeah, Rod Temper did. Yeah. I mean, I th yeah, I would see his name on all the records. And then at um, my horn section is called Groove Line Horns. And it was named after a heat wave song called Groove Line. Right. Very cool. I never knew that. I I've known your band name for years. <laughs> so I was at, was it Porchester Hall? I In think. England? Yeah. In London? Yeah. I think, right, we did a show with Bev there and she invited all these Albert people. Albert Hall. Right. Probably there. Yeah. Uh, Albert Hall. Royal Albert Hall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of a big deal. And I feel a tap on my shoulder. And so, and, and somebody says over my shoulder, I'm still ordering, I'm at the bar, I'm ordering a drink at the after party. And somebody says, I believe you owe, owe me some royalties. And nice. I was like, what? And I turn around and this guy's like, uh, yeah, you named your horn section after one of my songs. I'm Rod Temberton. He, put out his hand and I, oh my God. I was just like, like I saw a ghost and I was like, but you're white. Like, I thought he was just like, you know, back then it yeah. was like, yeah. And he was, uh, he started laughing and super sweet. I mean, the guys, uh, he, he passed away not too long ago, but he was a really, really kind man. And then ever since I, when I, after I met him, Every time I was in the UK, he would invite me over for mm. dinner. We, oh, that's huge. Yeah. You go up into a studio and he's got like all these Michael Jackson records. Um, did you ever relax around him or did you, did you always have that sense of this is the guy, this is, this is the guy. How do I, how do I act chill around him? Yeah, I did think, you ever poop in his house? No, I would never. <laughs> <laughs> that would be something good to put on the bottom of that list of pooped in Rod Templeton's house. <laughs> I, How about uh, number one? You do a number one in his house? I don't remember. I bet I don't you remember. did. That's, you should put that on there anyway. No one could dispute it. Who yeah. could tell? Who would know? Yeah, that'd be a good t-shirt. <laughs> I pooped in his house. <laughs> <laughs> but he was, the sweet, he was the sweetest guy ever. And he would just tell stories about how um, he started working with Michael Jackson and when him and Quincy Jones became close. And Oh, that's huge. God, pretty hearing massive. those stories. He kind of treated me like a, like a, like a nephew kind of. It was really cool because mm. the guy's legendary. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and then he he passed away probably about four years ago. R.I.P. Big thanks to Early Bird CBD Gummies, big sponsor of this show and my life. Really feel pretty chill. I uh, actually took a, one of their CBD gummies on the way to work today. And I'd been having a very stressful morning just dealing with some, you know, stuff as you do. And uh, the CBD THC gummies from Early Bird are amazing. They're actually formulated to make you feel great and not make you feel, you know, off your face. And that's the important thing for me. I've never really been good at weed. That's so dumb. I, it, it burns when I smoke it. It's, it I don't like the smell. The te I don't like any of it. I don't like the way it makes me feel, but not with Early Bird CBD gummies. And I want you to try some for yourself. Right now, you can get 20% off your first order. That's your, your entire order. However much you spend, 20% off. You just go to earlybirdcbd.com slash 
Deb. Order some of the gummies. I take about three quarters of of a bite of one and it's perfect just to make me feel, okay, you'll be all right. You're going to feel good. And you do. And you will. Trust me, these are the formulated scientifically. I don't know how it works, guys, because I don't know anything. But I do know that they make you feel good without feeling too crazy. So if you're chilling out with some friends over the weekend, maybe watching a game or two, why not do it with Early Bird CBD? Go to earlybirdcbd.com slash Deb for 20% off your first order. Was that the Royal Albert Hall performance that you, you were with Bev? You were performing with Bev. And that's when my mum texted me and said, I just met this guy in England that knows you and I'm just blown away thinking what, what's happening? Who could this possibly be? It was so bizarre. So from what I believe, my mum was standing side stage watching Bev, her daughter-in-law perform alongside you guys. Your then girlfriend and my mum are sort of having a little bit of a chat. Oh, right. And my mum and the, and your girlfriend of the time said, oh, I, you know, I live in Austin. Uh, that's in Texas. And my mum says, oh, I know Austin very well. <laughs> my second home. Well, I don't know if she said that, but she said, oh, my daughter lives there. And randomly, as you do, she, your then girlfriend said, well, what's her name? And not only did she know who I was because of my radio show, but I believe she had gone to high school with one of my best friends. Oh, weird. Yes. And so I reached out to that friend too. And she's like, yeah, I know her. And so it was a, a, a very strange thing. And I never heard that story. Yeah. And then, so you, know, my mom's standing there st- telling me this story of this girl and I'm like, oh my God, this is so bizarre. And she's here with her boyfriend, Carlos Sosa. I'm like, well, of course I know Carlos. <laughs> <laughs> and then it, it was lovely because I think then you sort of struck up a friendship with my brother, James. And um, we brought him to your house, didn't we? Mm-hmm. And Bev too. Yep. Yeah, they were here for South by Southwest. That was a while back. That was, a, that was probably at least 10 years ago. At least. At least 10 years ago. And we came over and I think we swam in your pool. Yeah, it was a good time. I definitely did a number one in your toilet. <laughs> Not in your pool. I don't wee in the pool. That's disgusting. Get out. Get out and do my, it on the side. My story with your brother was um, I remember rehearsing all day. And then I would see this guy just like always backstage and walking around like he owns a place. And I was like, he probably owns a place. Like, I don't know, you know, this guy everywhere. And then after the show, he went to uh, one of Jamie Oliver's restaurants, I guess, you know, like Beverly's close to him or something. Mm -hmm. So we're there. And then this guy sits next to me and he's like, Hey, I'm James. Cool. Great. And then, uh, yeah, this is my girlfriend. Like they, I don't know if they were engaged at that point. Maybe. Yeah, that maybe that was more than ten years ago. Yeah. yeah, I don't remember when exactly it was. But uh, we kind of bonded over gangster movies, mm-hmm. and so he's like, That's "Oh, funny. you like mobs? You like Goodfellas? I love Goodfellas." Yeah, we were just we we were like this, like immediately. And then he said, "So where do you live?" And I said, "Austin." He goes, "Oh, my sister lives in Austin." I was like, "Cool, great. All yeah, right. Okay. Anyway, so won't know her. Food's great. <laughs> yeah, I'm not gonna know your sister." And he's like, "She's a DJ," and I'm like. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. All right. <laughs> and then he said, yeah, do you know this radio station? I think it's 101X. And I was like, no shit, Deb, <laughs> that's your sister. Of course that's your sister. <laughs> and then all of a sudden I saw your and resemblance. Then you see us yeah, together. Like, yeah. It's creepy, isn't it? It's pretty creepy. It's, it's really bizarre how, how we look alike and it's bizarre when we're in the same room for other people. It's not for us at all. Right. But I think, actually, I think I've, as I've got older, I've started to look more like my mum and my brother who always really looked alike. And yeah. I looked like I could have been dropped off by the stork <laughs> when I was here for years. Yeah. But I was born at home, so I'm the only guaranteed actual real child of my parents. The other two could have been switched. And uh, I used to, you know, I used to hope for that in my teenage years when James and I were going through just awful shit. He was a real little bastard for a while. And if you listen to the, the podcast I with did. him, yeah. I, I didn't realize a lot of this was going on in his head. I didn't realize I had my own insecurities and I was dealing with, you know, the same issues that he was. But again, we see everything through separate lenses growing up, you, right. you know, with th- having experienced an exact same event, we will walk away with completely different memories. And that oftentimes, I don't think you are taught that when you're a kid and oftentimes leads to butting heads right. in, within family groups. Because you assume that you, yeah. yeah. No, you, it was like this. No, 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 it was like that. And, and we had a lot of that between us too. And he would be um, in these arguments would get really mean, would get really like nasty. Like talk to me like some guy down the pub he's going to want to have a fight with in a minute. Yeah. And it was really, it was a tough thing. And it's hard, I, I know it's hard to tell people things like that when you know him now as this like grown up man who's, but looking back in his past and saying, why was I like that? You know, as I mentioned in the beginning of the podcast, there's, there's a lot of that 
within men that feeling of, of, especially of not having control over things and james mentioned he's a control freak and uh, do, how where are you on that have you um because i've always thought you was actually such a really nice um a kind person your, your brother you no, oh I, me yes i'm talking about you i think i'm a kind person i think i've always got this um kind and accepting vibe from you. Like you, you worked with so many people in your life. I think you, you lived this like multicolored, multi-layered, multifaceted sort mm -hmm. of lifestyle and you interact with all these people. Um, and I feel like a lot of us are looking at, at um, toxic workplaces, harassment, you know, toxic masculinity at the moment and, and, and how it works within our lives. Mm -hmm. This guy who sent me a message, we just went to a Better, better person conference. It's it seems to be everywhere, and then we see also the stories of the abuse and the uh, harassment in the film and movie industry. D wh where do you see that in the in the music industry? Is that because we know about the Kesha thing, the Britney Spears thing, us over sexualizing women, and then also men taking advantage of women in positions? Have you seen? Is that been something that you've seen in the industry, or is it because you keep yourself? you know, you, you're mostly in that studio. Is that something you don't see? I mean, see? That, that would be probably touring. You know, I've mm. definitely got some strange stories of touring and like with higher profile artists. Come on. Exclusive. Uh, yeah. Right. I don't know. I have uh, no names. I, and this yeah, we don't, we don't have to say names. We don't have to yeah. say names. And, and honestly, yeah, we don't have to say names. I'm also a v very much about thinking of these men that have sort of fallen from grace, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they've done this in the industry. They've raped people. They've gone from sexual harassment all the way through to, you know, to, right. to physical rape. And I believe that, that that sort of behavior is on a spectrum. Mm -hmm. And I don't think there's a one punishment fits all for these infringements upon women, if you know what I mean. And I believe in stories of redemption. And I believe in stories of people going, yeah, I fucked up. I did that really wrong. Where can I make it either make it right or just in the future move forward and not do that. I think I, I would listen to your brother's podcast. Cause I was like, Oh my God, I won't. Yeah. It's James, you know, but, um, I was raised by women. So I didn't, so was he. Yeah. I didn't have, I didn't have a father. Well, I have a father, but he was not existing. Yeah. He left when I was like a year old. So, um, completely raised by women. My mother owned a, a salon. So you were and then I grew like, women. Oh my God. Yeah. Right. So I get along better with women, I guess mm -hmm. not better, but you know, connect, yeah. you know, um, I, uh, and I, I think that, like I related to James a bit when he said when he was younger and his, in like relationships that he had, that he really didn't care about them. And yeah. He would, you know, this girl and the next girl and whatever. It was kind of the same with me. And then after a while I started, um, I think, you know, I started, you know, the Sims foundation I talk about all the time, but I started, um, ha I started going to a therapist because of the Sims foundation. So Long Sims time foundation ago. Yeah. Is Sims foundation is a nonprofit started 25 years ago in Austin that provides mental health and substance abuse, uh, services for musicians. Right. It's, it's a fantastic program and yeah. I've done a lot of fundraising for them. And, and um, it, it's, again, like, this is another thing that's, I mean, that's how old, 24 years old, 24, 25 26, years old? 26 actually. 26. Yeah, yeah. So that was being thought of back then for musicians, mental health care. And there are other now organizations really focusing on trying to make that available for people, but especially musicians with no fixed income. It's, yeah. I it's mean, a Sims, huge foundation. Sims is the only, only organization in the world actually that does that right? for musicians. and. And it helped you and it like put you on the sort of road to looking at yourself and. I had massive ab abandonment issues mm. from my mother. My mother passed away when I was eight. Oh God. So yeah. So I'm sorry. I think that kind of, after my therapy for a while, I started to like, then when I would be in a relationship, I'm like, I've got to treat this woman great. You know, like yeah. this is, I have you, no more of this, like I'm in a relationship, super detached. I could take it or leave it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So that's been the past uh, a, a while and it's been, it's been great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for doing that. Uh, for, from my people to your people, <laughs> we thank you. We thank all men that have a look at themselves. I've been in therapy for years and um, I think it's, a, it, it just should be like part of your health insurance plan where you think about, you go to the doctor, 
every what, six months for a checkup or whatever. Yeah. You know, you go to the dentist every six months or whenever it is, get your eyes checked, they have a little squeeze of your bits and bobs every now mm -hmm. and then and stick things inside you every now and then. We do that. But what about the mental health? And I, I'm just, I'm, I'm really excited about the wave of people really it's a accepting thing it more. It's a thing, yeah. isn't it? It's like, you it's guys cool, right? are making depression fashionable. And I've been living this low level fashionable life for over 10 years now. And now it's all cool. Right. I've been in therapy <laughs> <Okay>. forever. <laughs> I'm not believing you people started. who are just jumping on it. I'm thanking you <laughs> right. and saying, uh, let's all do it. You know, last year I took a mental health break. I was just, I was having a horrible year. We all were, right? Mm -hmm. Some people can process it better than others. But I actually did some family therapy with my mum wow. and it was over Zoom. And, you know, my mum's super sweet, super yeah. kind, but I had a lot of issues that that uh, sort of I didn't realize until later in life that sort of revolved around my relationship with her. And um, I'm a very empathetic person and I always analyze people around me's feelings and how they might perceive things. It's mm -hmm. just, it's not a thing that I think about doing. It's just part of me. And my mum doesn't really think like that. It's not like she doesn't care about other people's opinions at all. She's it's very just, kind. Yeah, just it doesn't appeal to her or it doesn't- um, Interest not, her. No, it's actually- I think it, it does now I've pointed it out to her, but it doesn't um, come to her naturally that the way she handles things isn't the way they handle things. You know, mm -hmm. it's like she, she does only see life through her lens and well, I would react to that with X, Y, and Z. And you reacted to that with ABC. Well, I think that's unreasonable. Like you're too emotional, you know, you're too sensitive. And these are a lot of issues um, that I've sort of dealt with and that I think I got from my mom. And we, but we had a great time. Tears definitely shed, but it was monumental. That's great. And I imagine, God, if you could speak to your mom right now, you know, what you guys could work yeah. out, you know, give you a bit of peace. Yeah. And, uh, I was young. I was uh, super young. Yeah, but it's it doesn't even matter that you then at eight. Yeah, I mean it does matter that eight year old right. boy, right? Bless mm -hmm. his heart. Wouldn't you just want to hug him now? If totally, you could meet. Yeah. Oh God, I, I would. Everything's going to be all right. Would never let him go. <laughs> right. But it's the ten year old, the fourteen year old, the twenty year old, and they're all still there, and and they have to be dealt with. Mm -hmm. you, know, if, you know, I do this online meditation. And then you, they say you take all these pictures of these things, right? These moments when you were fourteen, maybe, and this thing happened, and your mum's dead and you've got all these things and they still live with you anyway. This meditation, they tell you to throw it on an escalator and, and make it disappear into the sun and it explodes. And it's a, the weirdest thing, but I've been doing it with them for a year now. And I've gone through and found those 10 year old versions of me who I'm still smarting from something. I don't need, I oh, don't need to carry that shit around anymore. Mm. I don't need to carry every slight or perceived slight anymore. Sometimes you don't even know that you're carrying it. You fucking don't. Yeah. You don't. And it, it takes a lot to, it takes a lot to get to the point where you're like, oh, oh yeah. yeah, you yeah. know, I've and done, it's hard. That journey is hard. And I said that in the beginning of this podcast, change is really hard. And so sometimes you've got to go back and look at the shit that you don't want to look at to realize that doesn't have to define you now, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. I've done, I've seen my same therapist for way, like over 15 years and she's a, oh, that's wonderful. she's a hypnotherapist. So we, we do hypnosis a lot. We, I've never done that. We've done kind of the same thing you were talking about, about the escalator. Yeah. But it was a balloon. A really weird thing was I was under hypnosis and she was telling me this scenario. Uh -huh. And then she said, you know, you wrote all these nasty things that your grandmother told you on this balloon. You went to the safe place, like your a playground or mm -hmm. a park or something. And then you let the balloon go. Right. And she was really descriptive about the Sharpie that I was using and I came out of hypnosis and I was like in tears and I was like, okay, I just have to stop everything. I said, that actually happened. Shut up. Yeah. Like what she was telling me literally happened. And I, and she was like unfazed. She was like, okay, cool. And writing down on her. And I was like, wait, so you're really not going to like, this is weird. You know, this is not just, okay, cool. Like you just kind of read my mind or something. Yes. She's like, no, I believe that there's energy exchange. And I was like, oh God, okay, well. Okay, right, but you're yeah. a psychic, dude. I was freaked out, yeah. Wow. Yeah. And it helped, though, even though it freaked yeah. you out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Um I think we got to go through some of those freak out moments and those moments of, the, oh, this is never going to go away, like this memory or this pain or this slight or whatever. And and you can, you can get through them. Yeah, I think it's hard to being, being uh, a man. 
mm. and asking for help. Exactly what I was talking about earlier. And it's so great that you've done that. And, and you know, if nobody takes anything away from my podcast ever. It's that asking for help and, you know, admitting when you're wrong, mm -hmm. ex asking for forgiveness, doing the best you can to, mm -hmm. you know, get rid of all that old shit and just and soldier on a better version, cleaner version, lighter. I don't like to say better version. I got told once by a boyfriend, I just want you to be the best version of you. And it felt really condescending. And I think they say that a lot now, but I, it rubbed me the wrong way. And so I've never well, like- You want to be the best version. I don't need you to tell me. Well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, already I, think, I was like, I think I'm pretty fucking good. Mm -hmm. I was really fit then as well. I'm not as chubby as I am now. And so that I think that's one of those little pins that's like yeah. stuck in my head. And so I- because it upset me. I don't want to put that on anyone else, but I, I feel like a lighter version of me right. without all that shit. Same. Yeah. Yeah. I think so too. And I think uh, being a Latino male too is mm. a little harder the way we're raised. And like, yes. I don't know if you noticed, well, but my the, first name, I'm kind of, I, I, yeah, the, you get it. <laughs> you know, you've got an O on the end of your last name as well. <laughs> yeah. No. But, um, but there is, there was a lot a of, thing. there is a lot of machismo. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of um, just stereotypical beliefs within structural family structures. Mm. And that, that is hard to, to deal with. And, and then to look at that and see how does this play with the rest of the world? How am I going to interact with the rest of the world who didn't have that or does have that? And now we have two of those together. It's, yeah. That's, um, I'm sure, not being easy, but. There was a point in my life where I was like failed relationship after like just drama and all sorts of things, like after one after the other, one after the other. And I remembered thinking, I was like, and it would always come back to like my mother somehow, mm. if I really thought about yeah. it, right? Yeah. And then I was like, you know what? At this point, I think I would be more of a man if I went and asked for help. And that's when I started seeing th seeing a therapist. That's wonderful. Yeah, it was cool. Maybe your mom sent you a little nod. Yeah, right. Like, son. <laughs> that's lovely to think of. Yeah, cool stuff. Well, but who I, knew this was going to be a therapy session? In yeah, a way here we go. This is, uh, <laughs> I was just thinking we were going to talk about the Gary Barlow track. Oh, that one. Yeah. 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 Did you, so, okay. You texted me about a Gary Barlow track. Oh, that happened through, De uh, through, through Bev? Beverly. Yeah. She. Gary Barlow is the, the, I guess, lead singer, songwriter of a, a, a very cute little boy band from the nineties, two thousands. Take that. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, big in England. Very, my English folks will know who they are, obviously, but he's, he's just a profound songwriter as well. Yeah. He's amazing. Did uh, you follow his, uh, Instagram lot or do you follow it on Instagram? Cause last year he did this amazing series. What did he call it? Well, I did. Cause that's when, I, cause I met him. I mean, I, that's, we had, we had a zoom thing, but it, it was, um, what was, I can't remember. So, but he would do, I, I know he would like the online thing. Yeah. Right? So he yeah, did, yeah. he would do his thing. He would do oftentimes covers of people's songs. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. They did one with Cliff Richard. They did one with Bev. Mm -hmm. I mean, he did them with everybody yeah. and it was, I would look forward to that every week when he put those out. I didn't, uh, uh, Bev and James called me. Um, and you know, we talk every once every six months or so. Mm -hmm. They're like, hey, what's going on? How you doing? I'm great. Everything. She's like, okay, well, so do you know who Gary Barlow, Barlow is? I was like, nope. <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, well, do you know who Take That is? And I was like, nope. Oh, really? I, no, I had no idea. I know. I they didn't really catch on here, but people knew who Robbie Williams was here, right? Yeah. He had yeah. a bit of an early 2000s yeah. hit or two. Yeah. So I, um, she said, well, Gary, he's like second to Elton John here. He's massive. He's, you know, all this stuff. He wants me to do a track on a, on his next record. And I listen to the track and I think it's a really good song. I said, I love the song, but I think the production is shit. Oh. She told him that. I think that's what she Ooh. told me. She goes, there's one, there's one man on the planet who can make this sound amazing. And he lives in Texas. And I was like, what? yeah, I was like, really me? She's like, yeah. Wow, what a compliment. I know. That's lovely. Even yeah. though you don't know who the shit Gary Barlow was at I, this but point. But she sent me the song. I was like, oh yeah, I'm going to murder that. I'll take it, you know. <laughs> and then we had a, um, a, Zoom, a Zoom meeting with, with Gary and she introduced me. And uh, that's what I did last summer. And ah. uh, it was really cool. There's a guy, uh, Fraser Smith, you know who he is? Mm -hmm. he's, a, he's a producer, another producer in London that I work with sometimes. And he's massive. He does... Um, Still work with him a lot, but he does like, I think he did the first Adele record. He used to play with Craig David. 
Oh my he God. He was the guitar player. Love Craig David. Yeah. I remember being drunk in a cab once uh, with a Puerto Rican guy. We were sharing a cab and the cab driver was Nigerian and he was playing Craig David and we just pumped it up and we're all singing it. Yeah, that, that was good a God. stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and so now he, I think, I mean, he's a massive producer, but I remember calling Fraser. I said, okay, so I have this song I'm supposed to produce for Universal, Polydor and Gary Barlow and all this stuff. And I've never dealt with a label as far as a producer goes. So can you give me some tips mm -hmm. or whatever he's he just like typed out all the stuff he says ask them for this do this don't settle for less than this blah blah blah. and i was like great Done. so i just like copied that sent that email to the record company <laughs> and they're like your budget's been approved i was like damn i should ask for more but um but anyway anyway <laughs> but it turned out great it was amazing uh yeah and it was like bev and gary and super simple like great song it, it was, was great song. it was really awesome yeah. We will uh, post links to all of these things, by the way, on the uh, on the uh, uh, podcast page. Yeah, nice. And you can follow Carlos Sosa. You're just at Carlos Sosa, aren't you? Aren't you? Uh, no, Grooveline Sosa. Oh, Grooveline. G R O O V E L I N E S O S A. We'll tag that here. I'll put it on the screen mm -hmm. for you. But um, it's lovely to see you. This is not the end of the day for us, you know. No. Let's go for a pint. You in? I have a therapy session, actually. <laughs> Cancel and tell them you just had one. <laughs> I know, right? No, go get your therapy done and we'll catch up soon. Thank you so much for coming on Absolutely. to the podcast. Love you. Love you. Well, that's it for the show today. Um, big thank you for you for sticking around and big thanks to Carlos Sosa, who uh, again, just made, made this room feel full of love and warm and kindness. Great guy, uh, Groove Lines Sosa on Instagram, and you can find out where he's uh, performing recently. Actually, every Tuesday they have uh, a residency at Sea Boys, which is a pretty iconic Austin venue. Go and check them out on Tuesdays. They'll be selling out very soon. So be one of the first people to say you saw uh, Groove Lines at Sea Boys. Uh, thanks again to all my sponsors, Early Bird CBD, Refine Aesthetics, and The Festive Kitchen. I'm going to bake up some cookies tonight, guys. Whatever you're doing, have a great one. Love you. Thanks for listening. You can find more episodes and all of our other Hot Pie Media originals baked fresh daily at our home online at hotpiemedia.com, the Hot Pie Media YouTube channel, or wherever you listen to podcasts.